prefer in Seattle, and I certainly do, having been born and raised here in Seattle. And um, it's always my pleasure because I was also lucky enough to grow in this very house um, before it became a museum. So I have this affinity for um, this house, this place, this land, and um, all that we do. And the fact that we have community partners uh, is so terrific. And so to have the old curiosity shop as a partner and having this exhibit is just so terrific. So thank you all for coming, and um, I hope we enjoy our panel. I'm sure we will. Okay, I get to have some fun here because I used to be a journalist, and I still, if I were to have a gravestone it, on the, it would say journalist. And so I, what we're going to do today, instead of making people make speeches, I'm going to ask some questions. And I want to introduce you to the people whom you're going to hear from today. We have three generations of Jameses here today and their family members. We have Joe James, who is the grandfather your grandfather, you are, but you're also the grandson of J.E. Joseph Daddy Stanley, who founded the Ye Old Curiosity Shop in 1899, but I also hear that it may have been 1901. Maybe we'll clear this up today. We have Joe's son, Andy, and he, your hands-on proprietor now. And then we have Neil, his son, maybe the future, huh? Fourth generation. Fifth generation, that's right, that's right. So, um, what I, and, and then we also have Peg Bitcher. She's not part of the technical family, but I would say she's part of the family, of course. And how would you like to have a job where your business card says that your title is Chief Wrangler? <laughs> I think that's the best job title I've ever heard of in my life. And that's what Peg's card says. And she really was the chief wrangler for our focus area of the exhibit. Um, we have in this, uh, we call this our large gallery, um, a theme uh, called Telling Our West Side Stories, colon, Work. And so everything in this gallery relates to work of some sort. And primarily it consists of information that came from interviews that middle school students did of elders in our community. But one thing we changed up for this display is that we created what we're calling a focus area over here. And prior to this being up, we had a focus on the Nucor steel plant, which many of you know is the Bethlehem steel plant for decades. And so we are focusing on Yield Curiosity Shop now because it's the direct West Seattle connections that you will hear about. And it's a lot of work, right? It fits the theme perfectly. <laughs> so we are so glad that to have this formal opening ceremony for this focus area right now. You also should know that our totem pole outside and our totem exhibit in the small gallery also are directly related to this family because we would not have a totem pole outside or at Admiral Viewpoint and a long history there without... Um, Danny Stanley's persistent uh, badgering of the city to get the Belvedere viewpoint cleaned up. He basically said, and we have the letters to prove it, he said, he said the place is an eyesore, you've got to clean it up, and if you clean it up, I'll give you a totem pole. Mm -hmm. And they did, and he did. Mm -hmm. That was in 1939. Let's start with uh, Joe, Joe James. Can you tell me, tell the whole crowd here, um, how you really came to know your grandfather. You, um, you lived with your grandfather up until the age of 16, and so you got to know him quite well. Tell us, if we, if we had Joe Stanley in the room today, how would you describe him? How, what, how would we remember him? What kind of a personality was he? You had a great sense of humor and uh, loved to entertain people and talk to people in the shop, uh, people would be looking at something to buy, and, and uh, he'd start t telling them all about it, giving them the history, and he'd fall in love with it all over again, and then refuse to sell it to them. <laughs> my, my, my dad, uh, his son-in-law, who was in the shop until, until he died in 19, uh, 
he died in, in 1954. But uh, he was the one that uh, was the sales, salesman type that uh, entertained the people and uh, loved, loved to talk to people and show them around the shop and eventually sell them something. And he was the salesman, and my grandfather was the one that entertained everybody. <laughs> uh, so what was your other question? Well, you lived with him, oh, and, yes. and I, I saw an interview of him, him, of you one time where you said he was a one-man chamber of commerce. He, he was. Uh, in his early days, he loved Seattle, and he boosted Seattle any time he could, and he really was a one-man chamber of commerce. He'd, he'd write letters to people all over the world and tell them how great Seattle was. And after having living, living, back, living back east and in Denver, which is pretty dry, uh, he just loved the Pacific Northwest. So when you were a youngster, did the did the sales bug infect you because of him? Well, of course, when you're a kid, uh, something like the shop really appeals to you. It did the same thing with, with my son here and also our grandson. <laughs> but uh, it, it's, it's an inter it was an interesting business, and, and uh, I, I enjoyed it. And, uh, of course, the war came along, too. But I started there when I was 12 in 1936 during an international convention uh, of the Shriners. Uh, and uh, I enjoyed working there. And then I, in high school, I'd work, I'd work after school and I'd work on Saturdays. But it was, it, it was, it was fascinating. And you'd meet a lot of interesting people from all over the world. And uh, I never could figure out exactly what I wanted to do. But as I got older and older, it just seemed uh, that I would come back in the shop after I, after the war and after I graduated from the university. So I spent uh, almost 60 years there altogether. Now, most of us in this room are familiar with Ye Old Curiosity Shop, but let's pretend that nobody knows what it is. How would you describe it to a stranger, and what is its appeal? Well, uh, curiosities really stretch people's imaginations. And that's what we, we had. We, we try to ha handle items that, that were curios as well as maybe had some practical value. But uh, uh, it just seems that everybody is interested in, in, in the odd things and, and all that. And uh, that's what we tried to, to handle. But, and also, of course, we tried to, to be fair with people. And uh, but we sold an awful lot of Indian items in the early days. We deal directly with the Indians almost on a daily basis. They come in there with their totem poles or their baskets or, or, or Indian masks. And uh, uh, the shop just is fascinating to people because of the variety and, and, and odd things from all over the world. Can you describe why your grandfather focused on those items up in Alaska and BC and brought them on down here? What was the appeal to him? Well, we'd have to go back to when he was in the, in the uh, when he was nine years old and in the third grade in in uh, in uh, what's in the no, no. Stu 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 I couldn't think of Stumville, Stu Ohio. He got a, a book from from the teacher for having the neatest desk in the class and <laughs> told all about uh, the wonders of nature and and. Uh, artifacts from all over the world and curios and it so whetted his appetite that he spent the rest of his life uh, collecting curios. And as a boy he used to roam the banks of the Ohio River and get Indian uh, artifacts and, and in all kinds of Indian items. He collected those and also uh, across the river in nearby uh, uh, West Virginia. But uh, he, he just uh, was very fascinated with it and spent his whole lifetime collecting. And when did he arrive in Seattle? Well, he, he, he worked in, in his father's grocery store in, in Steubenville, and this goes back a little ways, but I, I'll make it brief. <laughs> uh, and uh, when he was about 21 years old, he heard about the Denver Gold Rush. So what did his appetite? So he, he packed up and, and went to Denver, and, and uh, he, he had been working in my grandfather's curio uh, in his in his father's grocery store, and he started his own grocery store there 
in Denver. The first day he worked for somebody else, and it, it, he was so upset about the way he was cheating the customers in the grocery store that he quit and went out uh, side of town and went on a little knoll and raised his hand up to God and swore that he'd never work for anybody else as long as he lived. So he started his own grocery store there, which which was a big success also because any interesting item, any curio, he'd tack it up in the grocery store and he said pretty soon you couldn't see the groceries for the curio. <laughs> <laughs> so then he had, he had his family there, he had, he had uh, four children. Uh, my mother was the youngest uh, girl, he had three girls and a son. And he heard about the gold rush in Alaska. He packed up his, his four kids in the curios that he had collected up to that point. Uh, got a ride in a caboose on, on, on the train and went to Seattle and met an Indian there and he helped him build a little shack on the waterfront and he had his curios in there and that was the beginning of the old curiosity shop and uh, he, he made a, a success of, out of it because he was friendly to all the people going in and out of Alaska and they'd bring him beautiful items from from the Eskimos of carved ivories and, and carved Indian items and all that and they'd bring them into the shop and my grandfather would give them a fair price for, for the items and that's the way he got started. We still have Eskimo curios and Indian curios, but over the years it's changed a lot. You know, a lot of the Indians uh, still carve totem poles, but they don't want to carve these small ones anymore. They want to carve something they can get several hundred dollars for. You know? So it's kind of slowed up the, the, that part of the business, but uh, he just uh, made a success of the business because of his personality and he treated the Indians with respect and also he always treated the customers fairly. Now there's a difference between being a collector of curios and being a business person and selling things. Did he collect these things with the purpose of selling them or what, how did he determine what he was going to sell and what he was going to display permanently? Well he, he, uh, he of course collected things to sell but Sometimes he'd have an item that was pretty rare, and he would be explaining it to him, <clears throat> to a customer, and, and telling him about this this item. And he'd fall in love with it all over again with it, and he wouldn't sell it. So, but it was he was there during during the 30s, and then, of course we all remember the the depression. I mean, the younger people don't, but the depression in the 30s was was something else, and uh, it was a question whether to sell things and survive or or hold on to it and go broke. <laughs> so uh, uh, he, he, my father was there and his, his, his son, uh, and the, the three of them ran the business. And but it was quite a, 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 an art to keep, stay in business during that depression, and they did. They survived it, but uh, they, they had to part with a lot of things that they would have liked to have saved. But uh, as you can see, See, with all the things that we have there now, there's just so much that you can keep and so much that you have to sell. So uh, that, that's how the shop survived over the years. We've gone through a, a couple of wars and, and, and a couple of depressions and a real bad depression in the 30s. And the shop was able to survive. And we don't have anything that anybody really needs. I mean, it's not like you need food or clothes. <laughs> but people have a love for it for the unusual and for curios and, and they like to collect things. And, uh, we, we catered to collectors and, and the people that really appreciated Indian art. We've supplied Indian art to museums all over the world all during the, the history of the shop. I want to get to the others as well and you all have a chance to ask questions too. It's just not, not just me but I, before, before we move on I want to ask you Joe about totem poles. If you worked there in the, you're saying starting at age 12, and you knew him through age 16. Um, you experienced um, your grandfather's love for totem poles. Why was he particularly attracted to those, and and why did he want to bring them to Seattle? He he was very um, appreciative of. of the Indians and Indian art, and, and treated the Indians with respect. And uh, totem poles were the one thing that 
were, were available in that part of the, of the country, and he'd buy, we'd buy uh, totem poles and baskets directly from the Indians, always give them a fair price, and uh, th that's what created his love, I think, for, for Indian items. One last thing, can you reach back into your childhood and figure out the first curio that really fascinated you in the shop? What really bonded you to the shop? Uh, something that, that was kind of fun, that made you think, oh, I want to go back. <laughs> well, we had a lot of unusual things in the shop, but we, we, had, we had a mermaid in the shop. And uh, my, my uncle who worked in the shop was kind of a handyman. He rigged up a couple of lights in the eyes, and, uh, and people would be looking at it, and they'd press a button and turn the lights on, <laughs> and startle the people. But uh, the, that was the one thing, and we always said the one thing in the shop that wasn't real, but it, it still fascinated a lot of people. <laughs> so, Andy, um, you came into the business. I mean. It isn't a necessity for people in a family to stay in the family business, right? In fact, there are lots of dramas out there about people trying to break away from that. How did you get involved? What are your earliest members, well, memories of the shop? Well, I, I used to come down after school, um, in grade school, and, and sweep the floor or whatever, and I got into it um, just a little at a time, and I guess I just, over the years, I realized that I really liked going down there and every time I thought about something else I I realized that I really kind of liked working at the store so uh, it just stuck I guess. What did your classmates at school say about the shop? Did they did did they like going down there with you or were you were you an odd duck because of that? Uh, how did it work? No, I I think everybody thought it was pretty cool. I you know, I probably didn't appreciate it as much as as I do, did in later life, you know, you grow up with something and you take it for granted a little bit, but um, I, 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 people, people appreciated it and kind of knew what it was, yeah. Can you tell a story on your dad a little bit about some specific thing that he might have brought to the shop that his grandfather didn't? In other words, how did this add or, or change over the years in, well, in your dad's hands? Well, I, I suppose I guess I would think maybe one of the biggest things is um, Sylvester, our mommy. Um, Describe that a little bit yeah, in detail. Everybody knows Sylvester. Um, he's, he, the story we got was that he was found in the Gila Bend Desert in, in Arizona, and uh, he was shot and perfectly preserved um, within 48 hours. And uh, in later years, we've had him studied quite a bit. And, and we, we find that uh, the timing's about right and that he's certainly real, but um, he was actually um, preserved intentionally with arsenic. The, the people that examined him said that uh, he's the finest example of an arsenic mummy they've seen, which um, arsenic was a very common preservative around the um, Civil War time. And um, so that, that's probably the... The, the biggest deal or so known for him over anything else. <laughs> and who, who brought Sylvester into the store? Well, my father did. Um, Can you hand the mic I, back to him and ask, <laughs> how did that happen? That must have been a big decision of yours. Well, a, a lady called us from, from down in Arizona and said she had this, this mummy, or yeah, this mermaid, or this mummy or whatever. And uh, it sounded a little bit fishy to us, you know. And we, we've had a lot of odd things at, <laughs> offered to us over the years. So anyway, uh, she, we asked her to send us some pictures, which she did. She sent all kinds of pictures and, and articles all about Sylvester. And the more we saw, the more we knew that he was authentic. And uh, we ended up buying, buying him from her. And uh, she, she told us all the stories about him and how uh, her... She had inherited it from her, her father, who owned him originally. In fact, it might have been her grandfather because there were two generations there, and uh, she had it, she had this, this this mummy, and she didn't want it in her house. She was 
she had it in the storage locker somewhere and uh, was paying storage on it, so we were able to buy it from her for, for a good price. But uh, he has been a fantastic experience for people to, to see from all over the world. He's the most per We've had these two people come in that do mummies as a, as a, a living out of uh, the big university back east. And they, Quinnipiac, that's, that's the word, thank you. Quinnipiac University. And they, they've traveled all over the world and they've, they've studied over 600 different mummies. And they said that Sylvester was the best preserved mummy that they'd ever studied. And it was just by accident with, that he was baked in this hot sand and then preserved later on with this arsenic. So uh, he's, he's really been quite a, quite a showpiece for us. And, we had a little postcard made made of him uh, that gives gives a picture of him and the history about him. And we've sold thousands of the, of those postcards. So, Andy, um, how tell us how long you've been at the shop? When did you start? And and tell us some of what you've been able to bring to the shop yourself. Wow, <laughs> that's that's a tougher question, I guess. I I. You know, I was like in the third grade, I guess, probably um, when I first started going down there. It's hard to say exactly, but um, <clears throat> and let's see. Wow. Um, he keeps things working. I can't. <laughs> well, he's handy with his hands. Yeah, that's true. There, you know, there's always some old weird thing that you got to make work, especially you know some of the old arcade machines and such, and. Um, one of my favorites, I think, is the, our organ out front. It's um, an old merry-go-round organ you might think of, and, and uh, that always needs work. And some of the other things, it's, it's enjoyable to, and, and a challenge to, to find parts and to make sure that you understand how something works and how to put it back together. So you're the handyman of the. He's good, he's good with his hands. Seems like it. <laughs> I guess I guess you'd say that, yeah. So what's the future in your eyes? Is it going to be turned over to the next generation? Do you think? Well, we sure hope so. Neil Neil's interested, and and he has a brother, Justin, and um, he does pretty well too. We we just uh, we just finished a. a little thing last night in conjunction with Ripley's that has the exhibit at the Science Center right now and and Justin was really good at talking to people and and Neil enjoyed the event too it was it was really great we're, we're hoping we're hoping one or both of them will be involved for sure so let's move on to Neil briefly Neil <coughs> how long have you been at the shop and do you like the shop? What do you like about it? Well, I started working at the shop when I, uh, about about ten years ago when I was fourteen, and uh, I've been I've been at the shop ever since. Like you know, just doing when I first started there, I was doing stuff like putting shop stickers on things or pricing things in the warehouse or whatever. But I love going down to the shop and the fact that. No matter how many times you go in there, you can find something you've never seen before in some corner that you have no idea what the story on it is or what it is. And it's just, there's so many interesting items everywhere. It's really great. Can you talk a little bit about the place of this shop in the city of Seattle? What role does it fill for people? I mean, I don't think there's another one, is there? Well, there's a... It's it's a great place to go. Like oh, I hear a lot of people saying that they always like whenever they have family that come in from out of town or whatever, they always take them to this place. It's a place to to go and see things, and everybody from little kids to adults can like be mystified at something mm -hmm. that's in there, and there's stuff for everybody to see and to think about. Mm -hmm. Leaves you with questions. Well, great, Peg. Could I ask you to take the mic now and? Could I ask you also to move over to the display? Because I want you to walk over there and point out some things that people ought to see. Everybody, Peg Betcher is the 
the, the hands-on genius of this display. And when I say genius, I'm not trying to exaggerate because this display in a very tiny amount of space really closely approximates the feel of the shop. So can you kind of, for the audience, can you kind of go around and point out what you tried to do with this space to recapture the feeling? Well, that, the, uh, the poster behind me, which I don't know if you can see very well, but it, it's, I started with that. I've been looking at that since I started working at the shop 10 years ago. This is what it looked like back in the day. Every single inch of it was crammed with curios and oddities and, and strange things. And um, I love that look. It's the kind of thing that people remember, think of when they think of a curiosity shop. It's just filled with, with odd things that make them wonder. And everywhere you look, there's something um, of interest. Um, so that's the kind of look, when I first saw this shelf here, um, and, and Clay and uh, Sarah actually pointed out that it would be a great way to recreate some of the look of the shop is fill it with some of the things that you would find, you know, back in the day. So that was, uh, that was uh, pretty much of a, a no-brainer. And all of these items here, um, I called from the warehouse where they, we have a football-sized warehouse, which was a footprint of the shop, and many of the items that, um, that I found upstairs were ones that were on the, the floor as well. And our duplicates, we have more than one iguana, for instance, and lots and lots of moose racks. Mm -hmm. uh, many, that, that was the smallest one I found, which was really charming, because usually they're as big as a like Volkswagen bus. Mm -hmm. and, um, and a Native American carving, because there are so many carvings in the shop, a bar relief. We actually have a really extensive collection of samovars, which um, seems to have kind of fallen out of common uh, usage now, but they were, back in the day, they were the soul of the Russian home and always filled with tea. Um, and this is one of our smallest uh, versions that would fit on the shelves there. Um, the Japanese fishing glass floats, um, it's a connection with the ocean and the sea, which is continued on with our stuffed shark there. And, um, and many of the items, even if they're native made, they are, they're connected with the ocean with our carved paddles here. Um, I have one that is carved by a Native American, and then there were a number of people that were carving in the Native style that did not come from that tradition, but admired it so much that they spent their lives, like Harvey Colonnan, um, carving in that style. And uh, I also wanted to bring the kind of wraps around. I got a little carried away there. <laughs> like the shop. Um, and uh, Sarah was very excited to get, um, this is the desk that came from, um, as, as Joe's told us, is from uh, from Denver. This was brought by Daddy Stanley when he brought, you know, closed his Denver shop and brought it to Seattle. So this not only was, was a desk that he used, but other every subsequent generation. And it's been my privilege to actually work uh, on this desk as well. I never changed a thing. All of the drawers were filled with, it's, it's like the um, kind of a microcosm of times past. Mm -hmm. um, emptied, of course, for the exhibit, but carefully labeled. And, um, and some of the objects that were used in the shop, you know, like a little, um, this is what people used to, to seal the packages before plastic bags. Mm -hmm. And this little exhibit right here um, tells you all about Daddy Stanley's life from his beginnings in Steubenville, Ohio, when he was a little boy during the American Civil War. That's a little decorative cane he used. And here's the cane he used at the end of his life, just a few um, days before he passed away in 1940. So this is kind of his... Um, I wanted to include um, the family history and the shop history, and uh, crammed every available inch of space, as you can see. Could we all give Peg a round of applause for what she did? She did a great job. For sure. <laughs> so before we open it to your questions, everybody, Joe, can I get the microphone back to you for a few seconds? I want to bring this back to West Seattle. Um, you obviously remember a lot about the Stanley home at California and Palm. And it still stands today. It's going to be the focus of our home tour next spring. And I would like you to just tell us what you remember about this house. I mean, Joe Stanley didn't just keep all of his stuff at his shop. There were, he called this home totem place, and there were things all over the yard. 
Tell us about this home. Well, he had about, I think it was about 17 totem poles in the, in the yard altogether. <laughs> he had a, a, an acre of property there, and his, his son, <clears throat> Ed Stanley, uh, lived, lived on one end of it, and then uh, my grandfather's home uh, was on the rest of it, most of it. And uh, that's where that's where I grew up. We had a sunken garden or with with that shell mound in there. The, the, it was quite an interesting sight for people. And they used to come up to the fence and, and look at all the different curios that he had sitting around in the yard. Couldn't do that very well today, I think. I don't know how long they'd last. But anyway, uh, if, if he, if he uh, thought they were interested, he'd invite them in, into the yard. And the next thing you know, he'd invite them into the house. So my mother never knew <laughs> who was going to be coming through the front door. But he, in his house, he, he had a, a collection, a beautiful seashell collection. He had a miniature collection. He had an Indian collection. Uh, he had all different collections in the house as well. Uh, that that uh, kind of an overflow, I guess you, you might say, from the shop. But uh, people were, were interested in it, and uh, the sightseeing buses uh, in the old days that stopped there and let people out to come up and to the fence and, and look at the yard. Uh, I understand there's a three-story house in in the something garden at this point, <laughs> but uh, uh, we, we had uh, a little uh, miniature log cabin there and he had a, a, a tea house that he built for his daughter, my mother, uh, back at, when she was 18 years old and it was a beautiful, authentic Japanese tea house. Mm -hmm. so later on they converted it to, a, we put cedar lining in there and I had a little uh, a little den myself, except it didn't last very long. My mother got ill, but they isolated her out in this place, and in three years she had cured tuberculosis, and in those days that was really quite a, quite a, a feat, because a lot of people, once they got it, that was it. But uh, she liked it so well out there we could hardly get her to move back into the home <laughs> after she got well. What made, what made it fun to grow up in that house? Well, we, we had a lot of fun. I had a basketball court in, in the back end of it, and, and the, I used to roller skate all around the house and down Palm Avenue, and we had croquet set there in the sunken gardens, and uh, we had a lot of things in there that would be interesting for kids to play. Tell them about you know. the playground being voted the best one. Well, they used to have a playground contest in Seattle, and uh, they, they would judge people's homes for, as a playground for the kids and what they did. And uh, we won it three years in a row, and they, they asked my mother if it would be okay if they if she, they give her the second prize she, this time, because otherwise people wouldn't wouldn't be interested in entering the contest because <laughs> they could win. So it was, it was a popular place. It was, it was a fun place to grow up. Okay, I'm sure that there are some questions in the audience people have had for their whole lives about the curiosity shop or anything behind it. This is your chance. You've got the horse's mouths right here. <laughs> the colored masks. Oh, the colored uh, masks. Peg. Uh, um, they come from where? They're a, um, a gentleman who's... Uh, Joe, could you pass the mic? Oh, shoot. Thanks. Yeah, the question was about the carved masks in the corner there. They are uh, made of alder. They're contemporary. Um, they were carved um, how long ago, Tammy? Was that? Do you know? You've had them in the... Well, about 12 years ago or so, um, I wanted to use a representation of um, items that were, we're, we're still accepting and selling currently, current work from, from folks. Um, these were carved all by the same artist who I believe is of the um, Tlingit um, group. Yeah, and so... Uh, They're um, very attractive. Yeah, that's um, many people in the, in the who visit the shop uh, even if they've never been to the area before, they always are um, really taken with the art, and that's one of the first things they say is how how beautiful it is, how how 
you know, powerful and and, uh, mm -hmm. and colorful. So I thought it was necessary to you know provide a, a little glimpse of that you know, in this exhibit. Other questions? Oh, and also the the um, the plates are those. Contemporary. Can, can you repeat the question? Yeah, the question was if the plates that are on exhibit next to the colored, the carved masks are contemporary, um, they span the history of the shop. Um, the, the shop was always interested in, in providing interesting souvenirs for people who were visiting Seattle. And so the first, uh, the first plate was actually from um, Daddy Stanley's day. Um, I believe it's from about 1917 or so, and they go down through the history of the shop. They're, they add the space needle is in one of the um, one of the plates, and the very last one was um, was painted. Uh, that's contemporaneous. That's something we actually sell in the shop today. So I wanted to because we've had 115 years of selling souvenirs and creating mm -hmm. them. That was also I wanted to represent that as well. Other questions. Five two actually. When did Sylvia come to the shop, and how did she get there? <laughs> well, um, we had Sylvester on display there, and, and he created. Joe, Joe, could you start off and explain who Sylvia is? S Sylvia is a is a full size mummy in a in a glass case, and uh, th this gentleman came into the shop and he saw Sylvester at that time, who who was is this full size mummy in a glass case, a very wonderfully preserved, uh, his, his mustache and the hair on his body, uh, he's perfectly preserved, and we mentioned that earlier, how, how this happened with this uh, chemi chemical, with what? Arsenic. Yeah, with the arsenic. Uh, 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 anyway, anyway, so when this gentleman came in, about, I think we'd had Sylvester maybe about 10 years or so. And uh, we, who we we got him in 1954, 54, 55. Uh, this fellow said, "I've got a mummy that Sylvester should have a, a companion." So he said, "I've got a I've got a female mummy that I that that I would part with if you were interested." So she's not very pretty. <laughs> But, but but she is she is a, a mate for for Sylvester. We, we finally worked with him, and made a deal, and we 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 bought Sylvia. So she's on has been displayed on one side of the of the back door in, in her case, and, Syl, and Sylvester is on the other side, and uh, that's where, that's how we happen to have her. But uh, as as Syl. Vester was found in the Ila Bend Desert. Sil Sylvia was found in a grave in Central America, where she they were buried in the ashes and all that, and just slowly dried out, which uh, re really preserved her. So uh, we thought, well, maybe it'd be nice to have a, a mate for, for Sylvester, so that's why we got Sylvia. <laughs> yes, go ahead, Mr. Hosterman. Thanks, Clay. Um, I understand that the shop is currently closed due to the redevelopment of the waterfront and so forth, but um, when do you anticipate that it might be open again? Are they preserving it the way it was? How did they treat you in this transition? Well, they, they've treated us pretty well. I think you could probably testify more of that. They've been involved with it. Uh, it's taken us, taken us a long time to move everything out of there and out of the warehouse. It's been a real real job. Uh, we hope to be back in business in, in was it, 10 months? Uh, well, well, July 1st of next year. July 1st, but don't bet on it. <laughs> uh, we hope to be back in, in business July 1st while they redo the seawall. Uh, it's a big problem. It's a big project. Uh, and and it's, we've never been closed that much over the years. We've, we've moved a lot, three or four times over the years. Uh, from one part of the ferry terminal to another, and then to, to our own building south of the ferry terminal, and then back up where we just moved out of now next to Ivers. So I was involved in three moves, 
but all of those moves were, are nothing compared with what this last one has been. And I feel sorry for the kids having to go through it, but uh, we hope when it's all over that we will have a, do we have a space outlined for us on the, on the same ferry, or on the same dock, uh, which is where Ivers restaurant is, it will be too. They, they had to close too. So uh, we, we, it won't be quite as big as we'd like, but uh, uh, if we operate intelligently, we'll be able to make a go of it there. But we'll, we'll be on the same same pier. Pardon? Um, yes, you can probably answer well, that. Yeah, we, um, we, we move, uh, the, the Ivers is doing such an extensive um, remodel that uh, the, um, they're, they're getting ready to lease upstairs and... and that's the whole pier, not just the, the restaurant. The, the whole pier, yeah. So uh, we, we actually move back into the space that we're in presently in July and then um, after the first of the year they're building us a, another space a little further back on the pier um, which we will move into at that point. A third time. Um, so we, we get to move twice. Yeah. But at least it'll just be from one, one part of the pier to the other but the, the property is becoming so valuable and, and uh, that seems to be the right, the right thing for us. <coughs> Just to add, the good thing is um, we will have a new 20-year lease, so we'll have like a great safe spot for the next generation. So we feel good about that. This is my wife Tammy, by the way, who <laughs> was answering that. She's, she's very involved in it. She's been a wonderful help down there. How many years have you been there now? 35. Thirty-five. <laughs> she didn't know what she was marrying into. <laughs> anyway, tell them, tell them a little bit about uh, what could happen upstairs. Well, should um, I guess you know? I guess it's okay. I, we haven't we haven't been told not to say anything. I guess it's okay. Um, they're they're um, uh, in discussions with Ripley's to to put a. Um, one of their um, operations upstairs, and we would love that um, since we've had such a um, connection with Ripley's in the past. My, uh, Daddy Stanley was a good uh, friend of Robert Ripley's way back, and um, my dad always talks about how Robert Ripley would come into town, and after the store was closed, they would sit around and tell stories, and um, he bought a lot of things from us when he was starting his collection, and, and Ripley's knows this. They they know the connection and the history, and they actually can point out some of the things that that came from our store way back. And it would be a great uh, a great um, collaboration, I think, if if the two of us were together. Uh, but it's not nothing's official yet. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Um, this is for Joe. You mentioned that Daddy Stanley um, had a moment of faith when he launched his career, and I just wondered if you knew anything more about his faith. Um, you mentioned that he raised his hand to God and made this vow, so I just wondered more about that. Well, that, that was just his manner of, of, of promising that, that he would be his own boss and, and have his own business. Uh -huh. uh, he he had he had a, a deep faith, but uh, he pretty much kept it to himself. But uh, uh, he, he 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 was he was raised a, a Catholic originally, uh -huh. and and uh, during the the gold rush, he had this grocery store in Denver, and during the gold rush in in, in, uh, in Denver, and. Uh, during the panic of '93, the, the, the uh, everybody was was having problems, and the Catholics uh, wanted my grandfather to to give one more money than he was doing to the to the church, and and he he said he couldn't do that because he was having problems too with his grocery store, but he would give groceries to the church if they needed them. And uh, no, they wanted the cash, and that that kind of 
turn him off a little bit on, on, on his religion. But he, 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 uh, he was very fair and, and uh, treated people the way he wanted he wanted to have it treated, and, and uh, because of that, he made a success. It, it, it was a big surprise to me how he could come out here to Seattle and open up a little shack on the waterfront in the early 1900s and, uh, and make a go of it. Uh, he had to be well-liked by people, uh, and he treated people fairly, and uh, these people would bring in these wonderful Curios out of Alaska, and he'd give them a fair price, and uh, people appreciated that. And that's why he he was able to survive. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. Going back to the mummies for a second, um, why the names Sylvester and Sylvia, and who got to name them? <laughs> can you can you can you repeat the question? What, what about Sylvester and Sylvia's names? Uh, when we got Sylvester, his, his, he was already named. Oh. So we decided we needed a name for, for his companion, and that's how we came up with Sylvia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't show too much imagination. <laughs> <laughs> but we came up with, with Sylvia, but Sylvester had already been named. Good name. What more do we know about him? Do we know anything more about him? This this woman that had him in storage. What that was that is an excellent question. Uh, when it's a very that's very interesting and it's an excellent question. When they found Sylvester, uh, they could never they were never able to identify him. They thought it would clear up some murder mysteries and all that, and they they, they realized that he apparently had been. Uh, wanted by the law, and, and uh, he had stayed away from him because he had buckshot in his face, and they ne he never went to anybody, any doctor, to have that removed. He died with that buckshot in his face, and uh, he, he didn't want to, to any notoriety about it, apparently. But they were never able to identify him. If they could, we, we probably would, wouldn't be able to have him, somebody would have, would have claimed the body. That's, that's a good question. And how did the lady, she just, how did she acquire it? She, her her uh, grandfather was it got him originally. And then when he died, his, her, 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 her uh, husband uh, and, and inherited him. And he, he had Sylvester all around the Southwest in these in these sideshows and all that. Oh. And charged money to, to, to show him. And they also said that they had him back in Washington, D.C., for almost a year to do all kinds of, of experiments on him and all that. And a lot of people w wouldn't believe that he was real, but he not only is real, but they found the buckshot in his shoulder that, that where he was shot. He was on a horse, apparently, and they shot up at him. And they, they found the buckshot in, in his shoulder when these two fellows came out here from Quinnipiac University. They'd been out here twice and did all kinds of, of Then they took him to the hospital. Actually, yeah, we took, took we took him to the hospital. I rode with him up in the <laughs> in, 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 in the ambulance to the hospital, and, and, they, and they did all kinds of of, of experiments in, in, in all kinds of things. And did they see how the grandfather found him? I mean, they, even back then, they just found him. Well, they, they found they, they found him. Uh, uh, he was he, apparently he had been buried in the sand and. And maybe some kind of a storm had uncovered him, but that's that's how the grandfather found him originally. And he, he apparently thought this would be a great show for for the, uh, the side shows around around the area, and uh, charged admission to see him. We're uh, we're a little we're a little un unclear about the exact stories because um, you know some some of the things don't quite add up um, and. And these these people have done more more examinations, and uh, even though they they know he's real and everything, they they're they're questioning whether or not some of the stories were possibly made up for the fact that they were taking him on the road, and you know, for people to part with their nickels, they they um, had to create a fantastic story that would entice them to do that. 
Tell them that the, and, these people were associated with the National Geographic. And, yeah, the, the, uh, the, the first show actually was the National Geographic for when they first got their um, cable channel. And uh, that was called the Mummy Road Show. Half an hour show on and, TV. And yeah, that was a half hour show. Um, and uh, they were, they it, in fact, it, at the time, they said he was so perfect that they um, were really um, questioning whether he was real or not. They were pretty cool, didn't let on until they'd gotten into the examination a little bit, but they, they found out um, after they took a, the first x-ray that he was really real, and then they did CAT scans and a lot of things. And, and the latest thing they've done, they, um, they just came back um, a couple months ago um, with this Canadian um, company, they're filming a, a show for, it's a, it's a joint venture between the History Channel and the Smithsonian Channel called Mummies Alive. And this one's going to be a, an hour show. And uh, they, they did some more um, medical studies, but the, the focus is they want to they want to. They took a lot of filming, and they intend to animate him and bring him to life, and and um, wow. and show what it might have been like when he was living, and how how he possibly could have died, and oh, and sorry. and tell tell his whole story and what the world was like at that time. It sounds really interesting. <laughs> I think it gets. I think it gets um, um, aired. They're, they're telling us sometime in June, maybe next year, um, which is about pretty close to when we reopen, which is kind of nice too. <laughs> but anyway, that's that's what we know, and and uh, they keep. It seems like every time they they learn something, they bring up another question, and um, nothing's. They're not anywhere close to to uh, any any kind of identification, as far as we know. Do they take any DNA? No, well, they, they, they address that. They said DNA is great if you have a lot to compare it to, and he goes back so far that um, they could take DNA, but it probably wouldn't do much. Um, they've, they've done enough um, studies to know that he was Caucasian and a few things, but um, they're, they're quite certain that, that DNA wouldn't do much of anything. It'd be a futile thing. <laughs> Well, are there any other questions? Um, on behalf of our organization, on behalf of Sarah Balenson, our museum manager who couldn't be here, she, she's got the October cold bug. On behalf of everybody connected to us, thank you very much for coming today. And uh, please take, avail yourself of the opportunity to have some one-on-one -on -one conversations. And thank you all for being here today. Thank you. so much to the museum for hosting yes. this exhibit. It's, it's very it's wonderful. It's, awesome. it's our privilege. We appreciate it. Very good. Thank you.